And now I'd like to introduce our two speakers today. We have Naomi Hirahara, who is an Edgar Award, Edgar Award winning author of multiple traditional mystery series and war short stories. Her Masarai uh, mystery, which has been published in Japanese, Korean, French, and sorry, Japanese, Korean, and French, and features a Los Angeles gardener and Hiroshima survivor uh, who solves crimes. The seventh and final Masurai uh, mystery is Hiroshima Boy, which was nominated for an Edgar Edgar Award winning sorry Edgar Award for Best Paperback Original. Her first historical mystery is Clark and Division, which follows a Japanese American family's move to Chicago in 1944 after being released from a California wartime detention center. Her second Leilani Santiago Hawaii mystery, An Eternal Lay, was released on March 22nd uh, this month. Uh, a former journalist with the Rafi Shimpo newspaper, Naomi has also written numerous nonfiction history books and curated exhibitions. She has also written a middle grade novel, 1001 Cranes. And Sarah Kuhn is our second author today. She's the author of the popular uh, Heroin Complex novels, a series starring Asian American superheroines. The first book is a Locust bestseller, an RT Reviewer's Choice Award nominee, and one of the Barnes & Noble Sci-Fi and Fantasy Blog's best books of 2016. Her YA debut was uh, the beloved Japan set romantic comedy, I Love You So Mochi. It's a junior uh, Rare Guild selection for no a nominee for YA LSA's Best Fiction for Young Adults. She's also penned a variety of short uh, short fiction and comics, including the critically acclaimed graphic novel Shadow of, Shadow of the Batgirl for DC Comics and the Star Wars audiobook original Dr. Afra. Her newest novel, From Little Tokyo with Love, a modern fairy tale with half Japanese heroine, was released in May 2021. Additionally, she was a finalist for both the uh, CAPE Coalition of Asian Pacifics and Entertainment New Writers Award and the Astounding Award for Best New Writer. A third generation Japanese American, she lives in Los Angeles um, with her husband and has an overflowing closet full of vintage treasures. <laughs> so yeah, welcome Naomi and Sarah. Hello, everyone. Um, guess what? We're doing a hybrid. And by the way, I, I love coming here to the Japanese American National Museum because this podium is like the right height. You know, <laughs> this is like the perfect place for me. Um, so everything is a little bit different, right? Um, so this is also being um, shown on Zoom. So. I, I just give all the props to the Japanese American National Museum for being so flexible and kind of grasping the in-person because this is, I th this is definitely the first in-person that I've done here since the pandemic, right? And, um, and, but yet, you know, reach out to people who are not so comfortable coming out. So thank you so much, Janum. So I'm gonna to explain today's program. We're gonna have, we have special guests. We have read, readings from professional audiobook narrators, like the narrators of our books. And this is the first time we've ever seen them in person. So Sarah and I are so excited. And then um, Sarah and I will have a conversation and we're gonna have a Q&A at the end and that's gonna be a tiny bit different because um, uh, some of you will be texting, even though you're in the room, you'll be texting your questions in. So get your phones ready, um, and Joy or Elizabeth will explain more later. And we also will have a door prize. So that, that's the old school element that we've kept in. So I hope you have your tickets. If you don't have it, don't worry, we'll get you later. Okay, now for my, the introduction of my narrator. Um, in 2018, which is four years ago, I saw the play, Nothing is the Same, directed by Tim Yang and set in Hawaii in 1940s. It featured the stories of four young people and it was in our local theater, um, the Sierra Madre Playhouse. And in it was this um, actress named Chloe Madriaga. 
jump forward to 2020 when we sold our fir the first um, Leilani Santiago mystery, Iced in Paradise, to Audible. And actually, audio audiobook companies have been re relatively open to hear our suggestions. And I knew I needed someone very special to narrate these books. And readers who have attended my book events have candidly told me that my pigeon, not on paper, but um, spoken out loud by me, was lousy. <laughs> and then I remembered Chloe Madriaga. And born and raised in Maui, and who happens to be of Japanese, Filipina, and white descent, just like Leilani. So she is the audible reader for Iced in Paradise, and the upcome, um, this book that just came out, An Eternal Lay. And she'll be reading of the beginning of An Eternal Lay now. After her reading, Sarah will introduce the narrator of her book, From Little Tokyo with Love. And then Sarah and I will have a conversation here. So Chloe. I'm not used to people. I'm just used to sitting in a booth by myself. <laughs> a Sunday in October during the 2020 pandemic, chapter one. At first, my sister Danny thought she saw a giant jellyfish bobbing on the surface of Waimea Bay. The brown tentacles seemed to be floating from a tan hull. Danny was only nine at the time and an artist with an active imagination. That pandemic season, she was constantly drawing menehune, Hawaii's mythological troll people carrying water in buckets from the Waimea River. In her defense, there were a lot of creatures appearing out of the ocean and sky in Kauai that year. Our visitors had decreased almost 74%. The lack of humans traipsing around our island, taking selfies, snorkeling, and leaving their plastic cups and straws signaled for nature to heal and flourish. Danny, being Danny, wanted to commune with that giant jellyfish. She was unafraid of its potential sting, after which, when I was a kid, we'd do shishi on our legs to mitigate the pain. Her wavy golden hair was long then, well, all of our hair was long that year. I had attempted to shave my father's hair, but accidentally pushed too hard on the clippers. Ay, sus. A bald spot on the back of the head and a tuft of curls on our linoleum kitchen floor. I didn't bother to alert my father to my mishap and just arranged some longer curls over the empty space. Dad luckily wasn't the type to check the back of his head in a mirror and no one he knew would dare to make an insulting remark about his personal appearance. While Danny was approaching her target, our 15-year-old si uh, sister, Sophie, was on the beach watching something on YouTube on her phone. Sophie, Danny screamed, it's a lady. Together, they were able to pull the woman's body onto the shore. Danny was the one who ran to Waimea Junction while Sophie, for once showing good judgment, dialed 911 and stayed behind. Danny, soaking wet and the top half of her looking like a mermaid, breathed hard as she stood in the doorway of Lee's Lays and Flowers, where I was stringing lays with Mrs. Lee, my best friend's mother. Leilani, there's a dead woman in the ocean. I dropped the orchid from my grasp and slipped off my crocs. Normally, I would have easily been able to outrun Danny, but because of the pandemic 15 around my middle, I huffed and puffed more than usual. From the rock jetty, I spied the prostrate woman who could have been mistaken for a tangle of seaweed on the shore. My bare feet kicked up wet sand as I neared the body. The woman looked somewhat familiar, but then she could have been any 40-something kama'aina from Kauai in a low-cut one-piece swimsuit. She was Asian, or maybe part Polynesian with dark wavy hair. I stood there for a moment, not knowing what to do. Is she breathing? Sophie called out. It was barely noticeable, but yes, she was breathing. 
I had learned CPR at my old work in Seattle. I knew what to do, but I couldn't move. We had been wearing masks for months in order to stay six feet apart from people outside our household. So to put my lips on the lips of a stranger seemed not only awkward, but also a death sentence. Danny had cut up with me. You gonna help her, right, Lilani? Damn it, I had no choice. The woman was wearing a lei, which I ripped off her body, revealing blisters all around her chest and back. Great. The woman looked diseased. I placed her face to one side, as I'd been taught in my CPR class, and pushed on her small chest. Water flowed from her mouth, but she still remained unconscious. Like I said, she was breathing, but barely. Pinching her nose, I blew my air into her mouth around half a dozen times. Her chest hardly moved. I repeated the whole sequence, not knowing if I was making a difference, but not having the time to doubt. I was almost ready to quit when the paramedics, dressed in white shirts and dark slacks, arrived with a gurney. We got it, they said in muffled voices through their masks. I stepped aside, barely aware of the aid they were administering. I had gone to high school with one of them, Rocket Nakayama, also dripping wet. He raised his arm to me before they lifted the woman onto the gurney and trudged up the sand. Sophie, carrying what looked like the woman's clothes, and Danny ran after them, but I stayed behind. In the rush of attempting to keep the woman alive, my adrenaline had kicked into gear, but now my anxiety was starting to overtake me. What was I thinking giving this stranger mouth to mouth? There was no doubt that I had contracted the virus. I already felt short of breath and my lungs ached. I turned and saw the broken lay on the beach. I should have left it there, let the sea swallow it into its depths, but maybe because I had spent so many weeks making lays and arrangements for my best friend Court Kahua Kai's family business, Lee's Lays and Flowers, I couldn't just forget it. Someone maybe even me, had spent time threading the flowers and selecting the perfect greens. These were not the typical purplish pink orchid lays that airlines and hotel hotels presented to tourists. Nestled amid this flower strand were greenish mokihana berries, Kauai's official plant material, which made my fingers smell a little like licorice after stringing them. They were rare and expensive, available only on our island. So out of respect for the Mokihana and the arrangement's creator, I picked up that broken lei, carried it to our shave ice stand, dropped it in a plastic bag, and placed it in our refrigerator next to a carton of ripe mangoes we were going to include in food giveaways. If I hadn't done that, I think everything would have turned out differently. The Mokihana knew secrets that we were only starting to discover. The next thing I did after storing the lay was to head for the bathroom. I was able to find a bottle of hydrogen peroxide. I gargled a couple of times with the clear liquid, spitting out any germs from that mystery woman. And then I thoroughly washed my fingers as if I were a doctor preparing for surgery. By the time I emerged from our now shuttered shave ice stand, a black and white car marked Kauai Police Department was parked out front in the Waimea Junction lot. Waimea Junction had been my second home since I was born. It was a cluster of storefronts. The originals, Lee's Lays and Flowers, our Santiago's Shave Ice, my father's Killer Wave Surf and Snorkel Shop, and D-Man's Corner Watering Hole, next to a new one, Books and Suds, our landlord's soap and used bookstore that never really got off the ground. My breathing grew shallow again, and I got chicken skin, my typical reaction when I see the police. It was a visceral reaction from the times I was in the backseat of a squad car during my troubled teenage years. Standing in the parking lot was only one police officer, Andy Mabalat, my high school classmate. He had recently announced his engagement to one of our former part-time workers, Sammy Nunes, who somehow had gotten through nursing school at Kauai Community College and now worked as a nurse at our local hospital. 
His engagement helped define our friendship, much to my relief. We were clearly buddies, no romance involved. Hey, how's it? Andy had on a black mask, similar to the ones the paramedics had worn. A line of sweat ran down the side of his face. It was October, and the mayor had announced that the island had to prepare for another coronavirus surge. I heard you did CPR on that woman on the beach. You should go to the hospital for a COVID test. Sammy's been working the line. I nodded. Were you the one who found her? Danny was, and then me. Sophie, as usual, seemed to come out of nowhere. Danny walked slowly from the shave ice shack, biting the end of a plastic spoon. She was as suspicious as I was of the police, even though today it came in the shape of Andy. Andy had Danny sit across from him on a picnic bench. Tell me everything that you saw. Huh? Danny craned her ear toward Andy, not understanding what he was saying. He was the type who mumbled his words anyway, so the mask wasn't doing him any favors. Tell him what happened at the beach, I interpreted. Danny recounted her story, giant jellyfish and all. Sophie, not to be outdone by her younger sister, interrupted a few times, only able to pull her in because I went in to help. <laughs> Had you seen this woman before? Both Danny and Sophie shook their wet heads. She not from Waimea, I added. That much I knew for sure. Emily, the second of us Santiago sisters, just a year younger than me, crossed the street wearing a maroon Santa Clara University mask, a backpack hanging from her right shoulder. From the time she began attending law school in California, her gait had changed. Before, she had sauntered, but now she almost marched as if she'd been imbued with a new sense of purpose. What happened? She asked as she neared the picnic bench. Em, it's so awful. Danny got up and wrapped her arms around Emily's shoulders. They were the two Santiago sisters with golden hair. They looked like fairy princesses. I mean, real fairies from the wilderness. In a second, Sophie, dark-haired like me, was also part of the group hug. For two weeks after disembarking from Southwest Airlines from San Jose last August, to finish her law school studies from home. Emily had had to quarantine herself in my bedroom while all of us left meals for her by the door. Ever since she could leave that room, the girls had followed her every move. Even Andy's face softened when he saw Emily and the girls in the tight embrace. He transformed into the old Andy, the Andy who had ordered super grape shave ice with two generous squirts of syrup. Maybe we can take a little break. He turned his attention to me. Can you do me a favor? I waited. Can I have a shave ice? Doing something mundane from the life before was actually a relief. I ran a clean rag over our shave ice machine, which had been sitting there unused for months. We still kept the electricity on in our shop because we were storing a lot of perishables for a food bank that my landlord was running every two weeks. I had removed a lot of shave ice molds from the freezer to make room for whole chickens, but luckily, I found one ice mold to use today. Last year, business had been going gangbusters. I had even convinced Ba Chan, my grandma, to switch to a square wireless payment system. She fought it tooth and nail, but when she discovered how simple it was, insert credit card and voila, instant sale, she was completely sold. She became so excited to make transactions that she was constantly bothering people, even our landlord, Sean, to buy anything, even a 25 cent postcard with a credit or debit card. I was considering maybe opening a pop-up store in California, specifically in Silicon Valley, where our Sean was from. Back then, there were no limits, and I was more than surprised to discover that I had gotten so into making the business a success. Everything had changed this year. Bachan might have been affected the most. Despite her saltiness, she loved being in the thick of things, whether it be at the shave ice shack or at her ukulele lessons. All of that was gone now. Shoganai, she said. It can't be helped. 
Sean waived our rent money. That saved our skin for sure. Dad pivoted from producing his killer wave Hawaiian shirts to using his ridiculous fabric for masking, making masks. Since inter-island travel was being allowed without a quarantine, he was in Oahu now, making his pitch to the ABC store chain. Mom was at the sewing machine making the prototypes, while Danny, the most artistic of all us Santiago sisters, pinned fabric and cut out patterns when she wasn't zooming for school. Killer Wave, my dad's surf shop, was now open by appointment only for locals who needed some surf wax or maybe a repair. Kelly Kahuakai, my longtime buddy, brief romantic interest, small kid stuff, and Court's husband, left the shop to join his new bride's flower business next door, which was way more lucrative anyway. Although we didn't have visitors coming to get married on the island, folks were still having intimate weddings, graduation and anniversary celebrations, and funerals. Kelly was also attempting to expand onto the mainland with an online business. Piquello, Kelly's brother, had moved out of the shed in the back of his and Kelly's family home, much to court's relief and found a job with a kalo farm in the Hanalei Valley on the North Shore. He had given up for now, a return to the military, and instead of a gun, he brandished a machete. He stayed primarily in a spare room of our family friend, Rick Chen, in Hanalei. D-Man, my surrogate father, who had, who had to close his outdoor bar in the junction for a few months, but due to a new ruling in June, had reopened and was even more popular than ever. I wanted to help D-Man, but my father, now a recovering alcoholic and having a complicated relationship with the old surfer, banned me from being a bartender. Everyone seemed to have a new purpose, but to tell you the truth, I was lost. I had to say goodbye to my dreams of taking my shave ice concoctions to the rest of the world. I did sometimes say shogunai, like bachan, but more often than not, I felt mad as hell. I tried to cope by making ices for everyone. I knew what everyone wanted without asking. Andy's super grape, Sophie's blue monster, which literally is a monster combination with blueberry and root beer. No chocolate ice cream today. Danny's passion fruit and Emily's coconut. For myself, an ice with Kona coffee, black with no cream or sweetener. We sat at the picnic table, probably only six inches apart. I know Mayor Kawakami would not have been happy that we weren't social distancing, but at least we were sitting outside. Anyway, Emily, the girls, and I were part of the same household. It was only Andy who was the outsider, the person outside of our safe pod. The Lee's delivery vehicle, a red minivan, pulled into the parking lot. Court and Kelly, both wearing killer wave masks, emerged, Kelly first. Court was now literally waddling, her swollen belly resembling a giant mango. Look at the lady that we found in the ocean, Court. Sophie ran up to her, holding out her phone as Court struggled toward the picnic table. Put on your mask, Kelly who before had been all smiles and sunshine, had become ultra protective during his evolution into a future father. Leaving her phone with Court, Sophie ran inside the shack while I pulled my mask up from around my neck. Court, one hand on her belly, studied the photo on Sophie's phone. I've seen this woman, she said. And he leapt from the picnic bench and slid on his mask, hiding his purple stained lips. He was now sporting his sunglasses, making him look more imposing and less like Ohana. He stepped a few feet closer to court. She ordered a lei from me, a mokihana one. When was this? Andy started typing on his phone. Yesterday late afternoon, she was my last customer. I told her that I couldn't get the mokihana berries until the next day. Did she pay with credit? No, cash. Did she say anything? She seemed, well, a bit off. She couldn't get her words out right. Remember Kelly? Kelly was uncharacteristically quiet, frown lines over his big brown eyes. Andy glanced at the eaves of Waimea Junction. 
You have that uh, new security system, eh? One of the improvements our landlord Sean made when he took over the building was to install some cameras throughout Waimea Junction. We'd had some pretty, we had some petty burglaries over the past few years, and he figured that it would at least be a deterrent. That equipment's jacked up, Kelly said. I haven't heard any problems with it. Court readjusted her mask so it sat higher on her nose. I sent some domestic discord and butted in. Anyway, um, you have to talk to Sean about all that. Sophie, wearing her Harley Quinn mask, emerged holding something in her skinny right hand. Hey, Leilani, is this the lei that the lady was wearing? Found it in the refrigerator. I couldn't see Andy's eyes through his sunglasses, but I could figure out what he was thinking. Leilani Santiago is holding out on the police again. I was going to tell you, I told him. Yeah, right, I heard that one before. Andy switched over to being Mr. Police Officer and he confiscated the bagged lay. His eyes then fixed upon Sophie's phone. You're not gonna take that, I said. He had some past run, we had had some past run-ins with him illegally seizing cell phones. Well, then airdrop that photo to mine. I attempted to make the photo transfer but Sophie pulled her phone from my grasp. I can do it, she said. As a teenager, Sophie had become even more cantankerous and strong-willed. Bachan had commented recently that she was turning out to be exactly like me, but both of us pretended that we didn't hear her. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I am very happy to be here um, out in the world, but also supporting Naomi for the launch of her wonderful book. And we are going to hear a little piece from my most recent book, which is called From Little Tokyo with Love. I'm going to give you just a little bit of context for it. Um, the book is a modern fairy tale. It's about a half Japanese girl, a teenager named Rika. Um, she is a tragic orphan, and she has grown up right here in Little Tokyo. She does not believe in fairy tales or happily ever afters or romance or love or anything like that. She's very cranky and she ends up going on a quest to find her long lost mother because it turns out she might not be an orphan after all. Um, so she meets in this quest, this process, this young man named Henry who is a very cute actor. He's very cheerful and he is therefore very annoying to her because she doesn't like that. Um, so we're going to hear a short piece uh, where Rika and Henry are having a meal actually very close to here at the Grand Central Market. Um, and they've been having kind of a, a debate because Henry's from New York. Rika is an L.A. girl. And of course, they fight about which is better. And as someone who always is trying to convince people that, yes, L.A. is very magical, this scene was very important for me to write. Um, so to read this, I have my audiobook narrator, which is really cool. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about her. Um, so Emily Wuzeller has actually read almost all of my books for um, audio. And uh, I think I first kind of, this first kind of happened when they were looking for a narrator for um, my adult series, which is called Heroin Complex. It's about a group of Asian American superheroines uh, saving the world in San Francisco. It's very fast. It has a lot of ridiculous things happening. It has a lot of romance. It has a lot of big emotions. And so they were going to record all of them together. And they sent me, um, the publisher sent me, you know, here's some samples from, I think it was five or six different narrators, most of whom were Asian American. And they said, you know, like these things are hard to schedule, especially since we're doing all of these at once. So if you could, please give us kind of a ranking. Tell us, you know, maybe three people from this group who you think, you know, you would be okay with. 
And I said, of course, I'm very professional. I will do exactly that. And then I listened to all the samples and I wrote them back and I said, I'm very sorry. I have to be a diva. You have to get Emily Wuzeller because she is the perfect person. She is, I think, the person who can capture this series voice the best. And uh, so they did. And then um, I don't remember how this happened, but I went back through my email and I actually found an email from Emily Wuzeller uh, several years ago saying, I have heard about this series, Heroin Complex, and I think it's really cool. And if you ever record audiobooks for them, I would love to do that. So it worked out very nicely. And since then, um, she's done pretty much all of my audiobook. She's also done a lot of other audiobooks, at least over 500, I believe. Um, she's also won uh, the Golden Voice by Audiophile Magazine Award, as well as many other audiobook awards. And like I said, has recorded pretty much all of my work, including a recent Star Wars audiobook original called Dr. Afra. So to read this scene, I would like you to all welcome Emily Wu Zeller. Thank you. up a bit. Okay. Henry brings back, well, basically one of everything. Sizzling steak and garlicky sauce, lovingly ladled over a bed of sticky rice, a gooey egg sandwich, yolk perfectly runny, handmade pasta with luscious meaty bolognese, lumpia fried to crisp deliciousness, and tacos so spicy they'll make you sweat. I'm pretty sure the table's about to collapse under the weight of all this food, and we haven't even started exploring dessert options yet. I notice Henry surreptitiously glance around before we start eating pulling his baseball cap lower so it hides his face better. I look around too, but everyone else still seems to be wrapped up in their own food adventures. We're okay, I reassure him, attempting to make my tone light. No fan mobs. I expect him to flash me that easy grin, but he gives me a tense head bob, scoops up a taco, and takes a very small bite. And then the tension melts away as a look of pure bliss spreads over his face. Oh, so good, he groans, cramming the rest of the taco into his mouth with unabashed gusto. He chews and swallows, then gives me a sly smile. I'll concede these are way better than anything in New York. Anything, I challenge. You're really willing to forsake your beloved city over tacos? They're awesome tacos, he says. And all your talk about the magic of LA is winning me over. Pretty soon I'll have gone full Californian, wearing flip-flops as formal wear and talking about nothing but freeways for like hours. <laughs> he lengthens his vowels on those last two words, affecting an exaggerated valley girl type voice. <sighs> I. Never talk about freeways, I say, trying to sound imperious, but an irrepressible smile's playing around the corners of my mouth, and that just makes him smile even bigger. But I do think LA is magic, yes. How did that even start, he says. You do not seem the type to uh, see things that way. Mm, I think, hmm. I pause and take a bite of my own taco, the potent mix of fresh spices exploding on my tongue. No one's ever asked me that before. Maybe it has to do with growing up in little Tokyo, I say slowly, trying to figure it out. I know people think everything in LA is new and like made of cheap plastic or something. No sense of history or culture. I give him a pointed look and he shrugs and grins. Like, yep, guilty. But little Tokyo, it has so much of that history, that culture. It's been around since the early 1900s, and it's been through a lot. 
it used to have the largest Japanese American population in North America. And then so many people were forced to abandon their homes and lives because of incarceration during World War II. But they rebuilt after. When I walk those streets, I pause, a surprise lump forming in my throat. I find myself with a napkin trying to stave off unshed tears. <laughs> These tacos are spicier than usual. <laughs> mm hmm, Henry says, sounding like he doesn't buy that for a second. When I walk those streets, I continue. I can feel that, that sense of history and community and struggle and passion. There are so many stories jammed into every block. The whole neighborhood feels so alive. And then, of course, there's Mr. Sherman. Mr. Who? Henry says. <laughs> Mr. Sherman, I say, my grin reinstating itself. He's this ancient cat who's guarded one of the neighborhood boutiques forever. No one knows exactly where he came from or how he's lived this long or why he has eyes that legit look like human eyes. But he's always there flopped in the doorway and shooting haughty cat glares at everyone who passes by. Tell me that's not magic. It absolutely is, Henry says, nodding vigorously. All right, fine. Between Mr. Sherman and the tacos, you've convinced me. L.A. is an enchanted wonderland. Mm -hmm. well, that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much to our readers. It's so much fun to listen to them. And Emily, I am so damn hungry. <laughs> Where are my tacos? I want my tacos right now. OK. Um, is it on? I don't, oh, there. <laughs> OK. Um, I'm going to start this off, because this is actually, I think you're one of your first appearances here at Janum, is yeah, that true? Yeah, I think so. I think um, I I think I did one other um, kind of Asian comic book convention here. I remember sitting on this stage with like a bunch of people, but yeah, definitely one of the first. And certain, this is actually my first um, in person event since the pandemic started. So. Yeah. Okay, so my first question to you is, <laughs> why do you write all these young Asian American female characters? And also, how were you at that <laughs> particular stage of your life? <laughs> Good question. Um, you know, I think, um, well, I am a young-ish Asian American woman, um, perhaps a little less young than when I started writing. Um, but, you know, I think that there is something for me that is always very potent about um, the time when you are learning about yourself, when you are sort of coming of age, when you are figuring it out, you're kind of figuring out the world, you're also figuring out your place in it, where your identity sits, which is a lot of what uh, Rika, as a teenager who's grown up in little Tokyo, but has kind of a, a weird past, like no one knows exactly who her parents are. Um, she's mixed race, so sometimes she stands out a little bit. Um, and I just think that journey is very interesting. And that's something that I would have liked to have been able to read more of when I was that age, because I think it would have um, helped me sort of consider those questions more for myself. Um, and then as far as where I was, uh, well, when I was Rika's age, I was growing up up in a very different place. I grew up in uh, rural Oregon. Um, I was one of the only not white people in my small town. And so I think I, I just naturally felt very alien. I felt sort of like I knew that there was a reason that I didn't quite um, fit in in that town or with everyone else. And um, a lot of times books were, you know, as they are for a lot of us who are writers, books were kind of myself 
salvation. They were a place I could escape. They were a place where I could see sort of the possibilities of a different world. Um, I write a lot of fantasy, so it was literally a different world. Um, but I think um, because books helped me so much just sort of find a way out, find a, these different worlds, that's something that I really want to be able to bring to other people, especially young people. Um, and so I think that's kind of why I keep coming back to a lot of those types of narratives. You know, in Heroin Complex, the characters are in their 20s, but they're kind of going through that, um, that second coming of age that a lot of us sort of have, like, right after college or we're, when we're about that age, 22, 23, and we're just kind of like, again, refiguring out the world and, and our place in it. And that's always really interesting to me. Um, and that's something I actually wanted uh, to hear you talk about as well, because you have a lot of these um, kind of younger 20-something Asian American female characters who are also finding their place in the world, both with uh, Lilani and also um, in your Ellie Rush series, which is like the first thing I read of yours. Um, and I always think it's interesting when that sort of coming of age or second coming of age idea is in the body of a young woman who's also an amateur sleuth because she's sort of like sleuthing out this mystery, like finding clues, but she's also sleuthing out her identity. And I felt like in this book in particular, you actually have that with, with several young women characters where they're kind of like figuring out who they are in this world, also during the pandemic where everything's so different. So I was wondering if you could talk about that as well, like what kind of inspires you in that area? Yeah, because it's interesting. Um, because I have my Masa Rai series, who's very different. He starts off, he's a 69-year-old cranky man. And, and that's actually <laughs> my alter ego. Um, so, you know, Sarah, it's kind of interesting. I had to work my way into a female voice. So I, actually, I, I took a break from Moss and I did that um, middle grade book. Mm -hmm. Um, 1001 Cranes, yeah. so I had to inhabit a 12-year-old girl in Gardena, and then I could move up. But I love writing either older characters or like this 20-something women, and I think they're, they're both people who are easily dismissed by people. They see them on the outside, oh, I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to talk to these people. And I just find that extraordinarily interesting and, and a great minefield. I think for myself, my 20s, that's when I, I was like a very a strange person, young person. Um, I was an international relations major in college, and I wanted to save the world. I was one of these very idealistic people, and I actually spent a summer in Ghana, West Africa, and I got really, really sick. I had malaria. I had, you know, um, uh, all these different ailments and hepatitis, and people there were saying, Naomi, why are you here? <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> like, if you want to help us, you know, change America. <laughs> so I think when I got into my 20s, that's when I started reevaluating. I started looking at my roots. I spent a year studying in Japan. And then I came back, and it's like, what am I? I, I really want to write, but I wasn't on the fast track to writing. So I started working at the Rafu Shimpo newspaper. And in the beginning, I wasn't happy about it because this was my hometown, JA newspaper. I was a Pasadena Bruin. This is like the <laughs> newspaper that had my score, my basketball scores in there. And sometimes they got it wrong, you know? <laughs> and I turned out to be the best decision. Um, it, it allowed me to get to know Los Angeles better because I was a Pasadena girl. It got, um, I learned more about um, Japanese American history and then, then I went to Gardena and Crenshaw, Boyle Heights, you know, all these places where our history is um, so important. So I think, and then the tail end of my 20s, um, when I returned as editor, was the riots here in Los Angeles. So I think because of all those seminal experiences, both inside of me and externally, I just gravitate towards that decade. 
You know, I'm a former journalist too. Um, yeah. It's funny how that. What did you do? That I was um, I was mostly an entertainment journalist. Okay. So I I started in you know high school and college. I edited my school newspapers and all of that. Um, and then uh, when I graduated, it was I was in the Bay Area, which is why I set heroin complex in the Bay Area. That was where I felt like I kind of had my my second coming of age. Um, and I ended up working for a website that's actually still around called IGN which was a big like gaming and kind of nerd entertainment website and since I was a nerd and I had grown up you know being obsessed with like Star Wars and Star Trek and all of these different things that again sort of helped me escape um, I was like how cool I can <laughs> write about those things and people will pay me um, and so <laughs> I ended up doing that and I worked at some other publications I worked for a while at actually the official Star Trek website um, I think if you go on it, you can still see some encyclopedia definitions that I wrote. Um, and then uh, my last full-time journalism job was actually Backstage, which is, you know, the actor's mm -hmm. trade paper, which is both here and in New York. I was in the LA office. And I think, you know, I've been asked a lot, like, how did this, you know, how did this uh, former career sort of, like you were saying, like influence your um, your fiction writing. And I feel like actually a lot of it was um, towards the end at Backstage, a large part of my job was writing these really in-depth profiles of different actors and performers. And at Backstage, the idea was always, you know, we're talking about craft. Like, this isn't so much about the celebrity or who someone's dating or their personal life. It's kind of about how they got about breaking in, how they stayed in, and how that craft sort of sort of influences them. And so I think in you know, it was I was very comfortable writing about other people. I was not comfortable about writing <laughs> about myself. Um, and now every book is like sort of about myself. Um, but I felt like in writing these profiles and asking questions and going in and talking to other people that this actor was close with, um, it, I was always doing that sleuthing. Like I was always trying to find like, what is the core of this person? Like, why did they become an actor? What is it that sort of drives them? Why are they drawn to certain things over others? What are their dreams? How did they kind of come to those dreams? And so I think because I was always trying to find basically what what is this person's truth? Mm -hmm. What is their story? Yeah. That sort of helped me when I was starting to create my own characters because sure. it's a similar process, yeah. right? Like finding what is this person's story? Yeah. Yeah, I did a biography on George Aratani, who the museum owes a lot to. And I think I did that before I did novels. And I think that, because it was like, what is the not K-N-O-T of this person. What is the core of this person? And I think I carried that with me in developing Moss. Um, but with your, this particular From Little Tokyo with Love, I'm wondering if this is like maybe one of the few or only like why a book that takes place in Little Tokyo. What do you think? Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, I think... I mean, I think it's the only one I've seen so far that has it in the actual title, for yeah. sure. Um, but I think that... Um you know, as the as publishing has started to evolve, there are certainly many more um, Asian American, Asian Pacific Islander writers who are now telling stories that are closer to them. Um, because that, you know, even just a few years ago, I feel like it really wasn't that that long ago. There was sort of this like what people call conventional wisdom, but honestly is actually just racism, where it was like, well, you know, if you want to be like really famous, like if you want to really publish in a big way, you have to sort of hide those parts of yourself. You have to either write, you know, white protagonists or protagonists of color that are written for the white gaze, that are written so these characters are palatable. So they're kind of like people's ideas of what, you know, say a young biracial Asian American girl is. Um, so, you know, I don't know if it's the only, but it's, I think it's at least the only one I, I've read that's, uh, that's set specifically in Little Tokyo. So I think each one of you, since you're here in Little Tokyo, <laughs> you need to buy this book. <laughs> and, I, and I'm not even just trying 
trying to sell that. I, I really honestly, I, to me, it's like an emotional experience when you open up this book published by Pingham Random House, and it has Suehiro in it. <laughs> it has um, Bunkado in it. It has the JCC in it. It mentions this place, yeah. right? Yeah. And there's, I think it's just so wonderful. I mean, I know you're a Claudia Kishi, right, <laughs> yeah. fan, you know. Like, for me, like, growing up, I had, like, I think it was uh, the five Chinese brothers, I oh, mean, yeah. or something like that. <laughs> was it six or five? I can't remember. And then there was the the duck, was Ping or oh, yeah. Ping. The, there was nothing out there for my generation, yeah. so it's just wonderful that you have this. So how did you build... what? How did you decide, I want to have it set here and, you know, here, here? How did you make the, those kind of decisions? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, like, you know, for, for both of us, I feel like place is really important, right? Like, uh, from your books, I have always gotten the, wherever they're set, it's like a, another character, you know? It's what makes the, the atmosphere of the book. And I can't remember exactly how I landed on this, but I do remember that, first of all, I wanted to set something in Los Angeles because I'd actually never written anything set in LA. Everything I'd written previously had pretty much been set in the Bay Area. And um, I had really, you know, since I had started my, my fiction writing career, I had really fallen in love with LA. You know, I just feel like it's the most wonderful place. Like Rika, I do think it's magic. Um, and Little Tokyo was a, a neighborhood that, you know, I, I had come to as an adult, I did not have her experience growing up here, and that um, I just I do remember kind of having that same feeling, you know, from the passage that that Emily read so beautifully of just like I felt like it was so alive, and I felt like as soon as I kind of walked down the street. I just felt like very at home. And that wasn't an experience I had really had growing up. You know, when I was sitting for the first time in, in Suhiro, I kind of had this feeling of like being in my grandma's kitchen. Um, and it was very comforting. It just felt like, like home. And so when I was thinking about, you know, where would you set a modern kind of Asian American fairy tale, you know, with this this girl who has this complicated past, that seemed exactly right because it also felt a little bit like a small town enclosed in a larger city that had all of this culture and all of this history and all of these great stories, you know, of like different characters, like the cat who is a real cat. Um, it just like felt like something that was like this. This is going to feel magical. And I kind of wanted to show people who, who hadn't been there yet, like that feeling, like if you go here, you'll kind of get that feeling. Um, but yeah, it was, it was fun to do that. It, it felt like it definitely added to that, that fairy tale feel. Um, and, you know, I find your books very inspiring in that regard. I think like you were talking about, you know, how when you were younger, there was kind of, kind of nothing you could read that had that representation. And I remember reading, um, you know, before I knew you, the, the first book of yours that I read, which was the first Ellie Rush mystery, and just feeling like, wow, this, um, this character is like mixed race, Japanese American, like she's kind of a mess, she's just doing her best, like she's always in little Tokyo, like going to different noodle bars. Um, her family has this very kind of mixed aesthetic where their potluck sounds like my family's potluck, and then someone brings like a cake from Porto's, which is like a very LA detail. <laughs> um, so I think like, like I love that reading your books also makes me feel that sense of home and that sense of place. Um, and part of my, you know, the Asian American side of my family is also from Hawaii. So I, I've gotten that from this series as well. Um, and I was wondering how you kind of constructed that very real atmosphere, especially since, you know, travel for research and such has been a bit of a challenge the past few years. How did you kind of decide on Hawaii and then build that around it? Well, um, having a mystery set in Hawaii was in response in my genre, you know, and this is kind of like a traditional mystery, but we also have like what's very close to it is a cozy mystery. It's the Jessica, you know, murder she wrote type of thing. There's not a lot of gratuitous violence or, you know, uh, swearing or things like that in the book. But um, 
we have a lot of these kind of cozy mysteries in my genre, like they're set at a lighthouse, like in Maine, you know, places like that, like places I wish we could, I could escape to, but it'd be more like a get out situation. <laughs> like even if I wanted to go there, the people who lived there would look at me and say, you don't belong here, you know? And it's kind of like even the pandemic when people go to Wyoming, Montana, you know, they're getting away, but it's like, will I be really accepted in these, you know, very beautiful communities, but not that diverse, yeah. you know? Whenever there's, uh, you know, I love all the, the like, Hallmark, mm -hmm. you know, holiday <laughs> movies, but whenever the plot is like, I'm going home to my small town and then I'm suddenly charmed and I'm going to stay there, I'm like, this is not a happy ending. <laughs> I, I don't I don't like that like because for me that would that would not be something that would ever be appealing to me simply because my hometown I think is still pretty white and I don't sense I would fit in any better so you can merge, <laughs> merge the um, holiday story with the horror genre yes yes you know. maybe I'll do yeah, that. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, and then Kauai, I, my husband and I love Kauai, and it's a one, one of these places, we're from LA, but then when, when we arrive and the shuttle person's picking it, us up, he's saying, oh, you're from around here, huh? <laughs> See, this is how bad my pigeon is. <laughs> and, and it's like we are seen as one, a person who belongs there as you, you know, and I love that whole multicultural mixed, you know, feel to that. So um, I think now in this later part of my career, I'm starting to write about places like Chicago, Kauai, where I don't live. So this is kind of giving myself another challenge. But it was hard like during the pandemic, well, during the pandemic, I had to do everything online. So the way I would uh, justify that is like, I'm not contributing to the carbon footprint and they don't want, you know, tourists. So I'm, you know, the one thing I did do was I ordered poi and I ordered um, some other taro goods or kalo goods from a place in Kauai. So it was very, very expensive, but, uh, <laughs> but I ate that as part of the experience. Um, but it was interesting because, like Mayor uh, Kawakami, you know, he his, he's the mayor of Kauai, and his wife is a teacher. So, you know, he was trying to do things on TikTok to encourage kids to. <laughs> this is how you make a mask, and this, you know, it's very cute. And he gained a lot of followers that way. So. Um, Yes, and then you know, there's so many things on YouTube. You know, Andy Bumatai, he tells, he talks about pigeon, and you could watch, you know, uh, reports from Hawaii, you know, online. So I had to really depend on that kind of thing. Right. Um, I kind of wanted to end our discussion, kind of talking about this mixed race issue because I know, especially from from Little Tokyo with Love. Um, it's all about she, you know, the protagonist doesn't, Rika doesn't feel like she belongs, you know, and that's like an intense part of the whole book. And I, I think, and I write about mixed race young women too, but I don't have that angst as much. And I think because it's set in Hawaii, it's a little bit different. But I think because you are mixed race, you can, you know, add. Well, you said it wasn't a direct reflection of, well, I don't know. Why yeah, don't you just yeah. comment in general? <laughs> yeah. I can see your journalist background coming <laughs> yeah. in. Um, yeah, I think, um, for you know, for me, every book is kind of a, a discovery. It's it, like as you think it's one thing, and then you write it, and then you kind of figure out what it's actually about, and whatever issues you have unresolved that you know you can now work out both in therapy, but also in the book. Um, and I think, you know, for me, like I had kind of had this this journey, I guess, of feeling sort of in between in a lot of ways. Um, in Growing up in this very small white town, I obviously did not fit in. And I was coded as, I guess, like very Asian. Like it was sort of like, you know, you are definitely like a person of color, even though you're quite pale for a person of color. <laughs> you do not, you know, we, we know, we don't know exactly what you are, but you do not belong here. Mm. And I did get a lot of those questions that I know that also non-mixed Asian 
Asian people get in different areas. What are you? Where are you from? No, where are you really from? Your English is very good. How did you learn how to speak it? You know, kind of all of those things. Yeah, that so was, that was my, my, uh, yeah. the perpetual so, corner. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> I felt like I got that, and um, I did feel a nice sense of family from the Japanese American side of my family who were kind of centered more towards um, Portland. So it was a little bit more of an urban area. And they did have um, different you know, festivals and gatherings and temple activities in the summer. So a lot of times I would go to those and I would wear like my little kimono. And that was where I felt like, oh, this, you know, I just, I just kind of belong here. Like, you know, this is, this is where, where I fit in. Um, and then sort of like moving to different cities, moving to bigger cities, I kind of became more aware of some of the different, I'm not sure what to call it, I guess kind of issues within the Asian American mm -hmm. community, which, yeah. you know, there are kind of these conflicts sometimes between different kinds of Asians or non-mixed Asians and mixed Asians or people of different generations or people who are from Japan versus from here. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. And I think one thing I was kind of trying to explore in this book is some of those kind of intra-community issues and how while you know I still think that um, white people are the perpetuators of the racism and the sort of white supremacist construct that then breeds a lot of the, these other things I do think there are things that happen within our communities that we certainly need to address and we certainly need to work on and I would really like it if that conversation wasn't quite as taboo as I feel like it often is you know, I feel like, I think a lot of times I felt like as a mixed person, I can exist in these spaces, but sometimes I am not allowed to um, complain or to bring up different issues because I, I think I've gotten this feeling sometimes that I should just be sort of grateful to like be able to exist in this space. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly being in LA, being in Little Tokyo and meeting a lot of other uh, younger mixed Asian people, it was really interesting to hear how everybody kind of had that um, that worry, I guess. And then meeting people, you know, all different people in the community. There's also kind of a little part in this book where the, this group of girls, including Rika, kind of talk about how the different ways that they feel like they haven't fit in in different spaces. Mm -hmm. And what she kind of realizes, which is what uh, something I think I kind of realize being parts of these communities, is everybody feels like this at some point. Everybody feels like maybe they're not enough of something or they're too much of something. Thing, or they just don't quite fit into what people think of as like an Asian person. And, you know, I just want to like encourage us to explore those different areas of Asian America and show that, you know, it's it's not just one experience. There are all these different experiences that we can sort of come together and talk about. Um, so that was important to me. But yeah, I, I think like another thing that has always attracted me to, to your work, especially this series and the Ellie Rush series, was that exploration of mixedness. And what you were saying is so interesting because, you know, um, like the Japanese American side of my family, a lot of them are from Hawaii. So I went there a lot when I was younger. And that was a place where I did feel like, oh, there's lots of people here like me. There's lots of mixed Asian faces. There's lots of, you know, different family structures. I was wondering how you kind of like created that sense of like just mixedness that Hawaii, I feel like Hawaii has you know, just in that community. Well, I think that's our world, <laughs> you know, and I think with Japanese Americans, like my nephew is, you know, half Japanese, uh, part white, and his grandfather on his mother's side's from Uganda, you know, and that's just a reality, you know, so if against maybe my journalistic side, that's our world, so it has to be reflected, and of course in my, you know, I don't want to say, oh, some of my best friends are <laughs> mixed, but it's just the reality yeah. of our life, but you know, one thing, I, I have to hit this back to you right now. I'm sorry, <laughs> but just because it is set around, you have a, a Miss Nikkei. Like, <laughs> there used to be actually a Miss Nikkei oh, international pageant, but you're kind of <laughs> riffing off Nisei Week and um, uh, the, the beauty pageants. Yeah. I don't know, do you know there's a book called um, Pure Beauty by oh. Rebecca King 
Orion, I believe, and it's an academic looking, it's looking at mixed race people mm -hmm. in beauty, Japanese American beauty pageant. Oh, interesting. So that's a real issue that you kind of touched upon, which, you know, I didn't know. So now you can work your way into like <laughs> Asian American study classes. No, I, I love that. I mean, that was something like, I think, you know, because this book had a little bit of a princess element, like she's kind of considers herself like an anti-princess, but she's surrounded by all, you know, her whole family is like into Disney movies and the pageant and being princesses and both of her sisters are princesses and, you know, all of this stuff. And I, I've always been fascinated by, by that sort of idea, the pageant, you know, in Oregon we had um, the Queen of uh, Rosaria. It was like the, the Rose Festival because there are all, lots of roses in Oregon. And so it was always like the announcement of the court was always such a big deal. Like I remember I went to that event one time and I was like, who's it gonna be? Even though I didn't know any of those people, they were just like girls from local high schools. But I was oh my God, who's it gonna be? Like it was so interesting. And I think for me, like exploring that is sort of twofold. One is that growing up, obviously I didn't see a lot of Asian American princesses in media, and I think we've gotten to a point where like, I see white women saying, things, oh, we don't need this princess stuff anymore, Like, we're done, it's over, it's not feminist, and I'm kind of like, okay, but a lot of us never got to be a princess. <laughs> like, A lot of us never got that sort of like basic wish fulfillment experience, and I feel like we should get that even if being a princess, you know, like for, for this character, looks different than what you might think of if you see Cinderella or whatever. And the other was, I actually remember um, one of the first exhibits I came to here, um, I think was an exhibit about like mixed race yeah. identity. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was like a little newspaper clipping that I read that was an old man writing a really angry letter about the Nisei Week court because some of the girls were mixed. And it was this like, this is not pure, this is not, this is not who we are, this is unfair. And it just like, it sort of like got to me because I was like, okay, so the white people don't think I can be a princess. And also this old Japanese man <laughs> does not think I can be a princess for a different reason. And so it was just kind of this like, like, oh, like another one of those in between, where do I fit in? And I remember talking about this book when it was kind of like in its nascent stages to one of my friends, Japanese American, who did grow up in LA. And I was telling her like, oh, well maybe it's a I don't know if this is a thing, but I saw this newspaper clipping, and I feel like every year there's some like old guy who writes in about how he's mad because the the princesses aren't like pure Japanese. And my friend was like, "Oh no, I think my grandpa wrote one of those letters. Like that's that's not that's not false. That's a true thing that happens." So I think that you know was some of what I wanted to explore. His name might have been George Yoshinaga. But like, <laughs> we. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to transition us a little bit into yeah. an, a Q&A yeah. with some audience since we're coming up on time. Okay. I kept on wanting to, I was like, I don't want to interrupt <laughs> the conversation since it's been so good. Um, but hi, folks. We have one that's already come in, okay. um, and then we'll take a couple more and then wrap up the program. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, we have a question from Veronica asking um, if either of you debated whether you should use first or third person point of view, and how did you decide to go with the first person? And then also, how much of you is in your protagonist or other characters? <laughs> Great question. Uh, um, again, if I can see your journalist training. It's like throw it, you know, <laughs> throw it to, to that person first. Um, I love it. Um, no, um, I think, um, you know, uh, for me, first of all, as far as how much of myself is in my books, I feel like I feel like I'm in probably all of my books. I think that there are characters I relate more to than others, but there's always a piece of me. There's always a piece of something I'm going through. Whenever someone asks, like, who's your favorite character that that, um, that you've written, um, I'm always, it's always whatever character I'm writing at the moment because that's who I feel the closest to. Like, And so I did feel very close to her because she's so crabby and I felt like I was a really crabby teenager and I also was kind of like, you know, princess is gross. And then of course, like as an adult, I became like very girly and was like, oh, princesses all the time. But um, I think like there was, there was obviously something of me and kind of like I was saying, 
gang struggling to fit in um, in this character in particular. And then as far as the um, sort of POV question, that's really interesting. Um, I believe, um, I can't remember every single book I've written, to be honest, but I think I have written pretty much uh, primarily in first person. And I think that is something that, for one, it just tends to feel a little more natural to me, um, my writing style. I write in, in a very, um, what people call a voicey style. That means you can really like hear the person in the sort of prose, in the internal monologue, and whatever that is. Um, and I think also just the, the sort of genres and subgenres I write in. Um, you know, this is like YA contemporary rom-com that lends itself very well to first person because it feels so immediate. It feels like you are with that person. It feels like you're experiencing all these big emotions and all, you know, all of these things that we, we experience in our youth where everything is just so at the surface and so fresh. And so I think at least for me so far, um, the things that I've written have just lent themselves really well to that. Yeah, the, my Maserai books are all in third person, and there's a reason for that. It, I needed an interpreter, and that's the narrator to kind of, you know, because uh, Maserai is, is such a, a complex character. He doesn't talk too much, but I don't really want to totally go into his head as first person. And with the the women, all the my books from a female perspective have been first person. And with mysteries, that's kind of tough. The challenge is because, you know, with thrillers, you go into like, this is the sniper, this is the serial you know, killer's mind, and you can pop in and out to wrap, you know, to, to increase the tension. But if you're doing first person, it, it just has to be through this one person's point of view. How are they getting the information? Right. But in a in a way, it's a kind of a fun way, and I love I love voice too, yeah. and I think that's why I gravitate th towards first person. But with Eternal Lay, this is past tense, mm -hmm. which is different than um, the first book, um, and the reason why is I think it would be too traumatic to do something set during the pandemic in present tense. So it was kind of to distance, like, OK, she made it. Right, so right. you know. Like, she, we know she's looking back on yeah, it, as right. we will yeah. be as well one exactly. day. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I just want to remind folks that they can text this number. It's 213-632-6531 if you have any questions. Um, we're going to take probably two more. So we have one here um, that's asking about the biggest challenge that you had writing your latest books. I know these were COVID books or <laughs> pandemic books for both of you, but if there's any other ones. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think exactly because just d deciding, okay, I'm going to, you know, take on the pandemic and that's not a popular decision. I think most people in the cozy genre of mystery are deciding to ignore it. Either have their books set in 2019 <laughs> or before that, or you know, just totally ignore it. And um, yeah, but I couldn't, I couldn't make that decision. I, I wanted to take it on. Yeah, no, I I loved the way you handled that in this book because I think I think when the past tense did help because I was like, oh, she's okay, like you know, she and her family are probably okay. I don't have to worry too much about them, um, and also because it is in like you were saying, kind of this enclosed community. It also felt like okay, they they are talking a lot about you know, how they handle masks, like she's wiping down the, the shave ice machine, like they have their routine, which in a way felt a little bit comforting because I was like, oh, I have my routines. You know, I grew those uh, window, window sills, green onions, like everyone else. Like, you know, we kind of developed all those little practices and habits during the pandemic. Um, but um, yeah, I think um, that probably was the greatest, that probably has been the greatest challenge with um, any of my recent books, you know, this one, like I was talking about in the meet and greet before, I had sold it on proposal. So I wrote like a synopsis in three chapters at the end of 2019. And that meant I still had to write the rest of the book. And so I ended up writing a lot of it during the summer of 2020, which was very traumatic for a lot of reasons. Um, but a lot of something I kept thinking about was just like, this, you know, we have a version of, of Nisei Week, we have a version of this festival, it's so beautiful and happens every year and is one of those things that really made me fall in love with Little Tokyo. 
and we can't have it this year. You know, that feels, there's something about writing that when it's not possible that feels so sad. But I think what I ultimately came to, and I think kind of what you were talking a bit a little bit with, uh, talking about a little bit with the past tense is eventually what I felt I was writing was my version of, of hope. Like I was like, this has happened before, this will happen again. This, what is in this book, will be possible again. And so I need to write the most sort of joyful, vibrant, hopeful version of that so that when other people read that, read this, I hope that is the same feeling they get. That, wow, okay, maybe this isn't something we can do right now, but this will happen again. I will see that parade again. I will see this beautiful community coming together again, and that is something that's that's possible. Um, but just like writing through my own mental barrier of that, I would say was definitely the biggest challenge. That's very, very well said, Sarah. And I think a really lovely place that we can end the program today. I think, um, thank you so much. Can I get another round of applause for Sarah and Naomi? Um, oh, actually, we have a door prize, don't we? Oh, yeah. um, let me have the tickets brought in here really quick. Um, but while we're doing that, I want to remind you that you can purchase um, both the books that you see up here um, on... Uh, uh, <laughs> multitasking. Um, you can purchase both of the books that we talked about today um, right outside in the lobby, and we'll be doing a signing as well. Um, and we have all of Naomi's other books also in the museum store across the plaza. Um, and we encourage you also to visit our galleries. You get admission with your sticker, so you can check out our exhibitions, especially the Mine Okubo's Masterpiece Exhibition, which closes tomorrow. So this is your last chance. Please go check that out. Um, it's very good. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, and with that, uh, thank you so so much again to Naomi and Sarah. Thank you to you all for being here. Um, we really appreciate it. I am going to have to go grab the tickets really quick for the door prize because I forgot to bring those in with me. Um, but just hang tight one moment. And yes, oh my gosh, thank you, Emily and Chloe. Please a round of applause for them as well. Why don't um, we make this a photo op? Yes. Well, um, so if Chloe and Emily could come down, and my friends who have, I forgot my cell phone in the green room, so my friends, if you could take pictures and send it to me later.